Hi there, welcome to my podcast. My name is Lili Davalon and with this podcast I want to take a look at the bilingual matura in Switzerland. Although the bilingual gymnasium is not an entirely new concept, in the Canton Fribourg, for instance, bilingual education has almost traditional value. It has become more and more popular over time. I myself did not go to a bilingual gymnasium, but I find the concept very interesting, particularly because Switzerland is a multilingual country and language plays an important part in our education. So with that podcast, I want to investigate some more. For those who do not know what a gymnasium is, uh, basically it is a school. There are differences between the cantons, but in most cases the gymnasium starts after the obligatory school period and lasts between three to four years. With the Matura diploma, which the students get at the end of their studies after their Matura exams, the students are then entitled to go to a Swiss university. So essentially the Matura diploma is a direct means to go to university. Just to give you a number, in 2014 around 20% of Swiss students got their Matura diploma. And this is what we are going to look at in my presentation. As Switzerland is pretty unusual in terms of the different languages that are spoken, as I already hinted, we are first going to look at that. Then I will give you short input on the foreign language teaching regulations in Switzerland and the controversies when it comes to which languages should be taught first. After that, we will come to the main part of this presentation, named to the bilingual matura in Switzerland. I will cover the arrays of the bilingual immersion programs and the languages of those programs. Then we will take a look at the federal regulations concerning bilingual matura classes, the length and content of the immersion programs, at the matura classes themselves, and at the teachers and their formation. In the last part, there will be a comparison of the Swiss immersion model and other models. After that follows my conclusion and a list of my references. So let's get started. This first bar part of my presentation will be based mostly on information from the website of the Swiss Federal Statistical Office and their publication of the population census from the year 2000. So it is pretty well known that Switzerland is a multilingual country. It has four official languages, German, spoken by 63.5% of the population, uh, French with 22.5%, Italian with 8.1% speakers, and Romansh, which form a minority with only 0.5% of speakers. The Article 70 in the Federal Constitution regulates that the cantons can choose their official languages themselves. But there are also many other languages spoken in Switzerland. 21.8% of people living in Switzerland speak a language that is not one of those four official languages. Those are, for instance, English, Portuguese and Albanian. That does make Switzerland not only multilingual, but also multicultural. When we add up those numbers, we get a total of 116.4%. How come? Well, this shows us that some people speak two or more languages, but also that most permanent residents in Switzerland are not bilingual, but speak one language only. Here a quote from a slightly older source from Anthony de Soto. What he says is that Switzerland is not a, a bilingual nation. Switzerland is a nation which has four official languages. The Swiss are well aware that they are not bilingual and in fact they do not aspire to be. 
While the first part of this quote is certainly still true when we look at the numbers we just discussed, um, there seemed to be a change in the willingness of Swiss people to learn another language, but we will come to that in a minute. When we talk of Switzerland being that multilingual country, we have to be aware that the four official languages are not distributed evenly throughout Switzerland. As you can see on this map, there are distinct language regions. The red parts mark the German-speaking part of Switzerland, blue stands for the Francophone part, green for the Italian and the yellowish uh, colored spots for the Romance part of Switzerland. While the majority of Swiss people, as we just saw, are not bilingual, there are bilingual cantons in Switzerland due to their location between the different language regions. Bilingual cantons with German and French as their official language are Bern, Wallis and Fribourg. Graubünden is the only trilingual canton with Romansch, Italian and German as its official languages. It is laid out in our constitution that the Federation and the cantons should promote communication between the different language regions, as well as preserve the Italian and the Romansch languages as they are in the minority. The four official languages are also promoted in our school education. Traditionally, the cantons are responsible for their educational system. But in 2007, the Harmos conquered it past, leading to a harmonization between the school systems of the different cantons. 15 cantons have accepted the Harmos so far, among other things like making the kindergarten obligatory, all students in those cantons must now learn one foreign language in third grade and one in the fifth grade. While one foreign language has to be English, the other one has to be one out of those four official Swiss languages. After the obligatory school education, the students should have equal ability in both languages. This raises the question how that can even be possible, but I won't go into that. In addition, the school also needs to offer facultative lessons in another official Swiss language during this obligatory school period. The controversy that arises is which language should be taught first, an official Swiss language or English? The different cantons can decide that for themselves, and this leads to a pretty heated discussion over which language should be taught first. In the German-speaking part of Switzerland, most discussions are about whether it should be English or French. Sadly, Italian and Romansch are pretty much ignored in this discussion. Economie Suisse compiled a list of the advantages for both French and English as first foreign language. I just want to show you the most prominent arguments. Uh, some of the advantages for French according to Economie Suisse are that it is a Swiss language and therefore belongs to our culture. Teaching French first is also seen as a means of strengthening the relationship between the French and German speaking parts to create a feeling of togetherness while promoting Swiss identity. The arguments for English on the other side are that the communication within Switzerland would become easier as it would, it would not discriminate Italian and Roman speaking parts since we would all be able to, to communicate in English. Another important argument for Economie Suisse is also that English is a international language and the language of research and technology. So that's what the situation looks like at the moment. Out of 26 cantons, 14 chose to teach English first. 
We have to keep in mind, of course, that the Harmos hasn't been implemented in all cantons yet, so there are still differences on when the students learn the first foreign language. 14 is not an overwhelming majority, but it still shows that there seems to be a pull towards English. There are also no French, Italian or Romance speaking cantons that teach English first. This is also an indication that those cantons are more dependent on learning another Swiss language because they are in the minority. It's quite an emotional debate over which languages should be taught first and in the very least this shows us that people are interested in the language teaching system of our country. Besides that, the students' interest of learning foreign languages seems also to have increased over time. And that's where we come back to the quote of Anthony de Soto I showed you a moment ago. When de Soto wrote his article in the 80s, he noted that Swiss people do not seem interested in being bilingual, that they also do not aspire to be bilingual. This might have been a case in the 80s because in 1989, 1990, there were only two immersion programs at Swiss gymnasiums. Since then, quite a lot has changed. Here a figure from a publication from the State Secretariat for Education. As you can see, there has been a definite increase of immersion programs while in 1989-1990 there were two immersion programs, in 2006-2007 there were 70. That's an increase of, and I, I really hope I don't make a complete fool out of myself with my math skills, that's an increase of 3,400%, which is quite enormous. 18 cantons now offer 70 immersion programs. Out of those 70 gymnasiums, 59 offer one immersion program only, while 11 offer two immersion programs. So there are 81 immersion programs in total. The EDECA, the Swiss Conference of Cantonal Ministers of Education, conducted a study on the bilingual mature in Switzerland and developed a self-assessment for Swiss gymnasiums that offer immersion programs. And this study from the EDECA will function as the base source of the main part of this podcast. The evaluation of this assessment revealed that the number one reason why those immersion, immersion programs came into existence is because of the demand of the parents and the students. What I find quite interesting is that the second most named reason of why those immersion programs came to life is apparently because most schools feel like it benefits their reputation, that it will set them apart from other schools. In other words, having a bilingual matura class is seen as something quite prestigious and as the demand has been increasing so drastically, more and more schools feel the need to establish their own bilingual immersion programs. But in what languages do the gymnasiums offer their immersion programs? As I said, there are 81 immersion programs. 41 of them are in English, 24 in German, 12 in French, and two each in Italian and Romance. So this trend of wanting to learn English, as we saw before when I talked about the language teaching controversy, this trend is also reflected on the Matura level. 36 gymnasiums out of the 41, that's over 80%, that offer English immersion programs are from the German-speaking part of Switzerland. Here again, we see that the German-speaking part of Switzerland, as it forms a majority does not feel the need to learn another Swiss language. When asked why the gymnasiums offer the languages they do, the number one answer was because of the significance and importance of the language. 
in the Romandie, the French-speaking part of Switzerland, over 80% of the immersion programs are held in German. Here again, I want to look at, want to look at a quote from De Soto, where he states that in the success-oriented society of Switzerland, it is easier to rise to positions of power in the Confederation, starting from the industrial and banking centers of the North, rather than it is from the Swiss Homo or Francophone cantons. When looking at those numbers, the Francophone residents of Switzerland apparently still think similarly to De Soto, or at least a desire of being able to have a good work position might be one of the reasons why so many speaking a minority language of Switzerland choose a German and German immersion program. As I already mentioned, traditionally the cantons are responsible for their educational system, although there have been some changes regarding that lately. Nevertheless, the cantons still have quite a lot of freedom regarding how they want to organize their gymnasiums. But as, if, as with the mature diploma, all Swiss students can go to every university in Switzerland, there are some more federal regulations. The Swiss Matura Commission, a group of experts from the Federal Department of Economic Affairs, Education and Research, put together in effect regulations for the bilingual matura, which do have to be implemented Swiss-wide. Those are some of the most important points. First of all, the immersion programs need to be in English or one of the four official Swiss languages. Another regulation is that all students must have a minimum of 800 lessons in the immersion language but the uh, number of lessons can't surpass 50% of the entire curri curriculum. They also need a minimum of three graded subjects taught in the immersion language. The Matura paper could also count as a subject. There are two different ways a student can get his or her bilingual Matura diploma at the end of their studies. Either they spend one year at a host gymnasium where the target language is the first language, that would be model B, or they do the, let's say, more standard, standard version, the partial immersion at their own local gymnasium. What stays the same is that the cantons are responsible for the teachers they employ, so it's their responsibility that they employ teachers that are proficient in the language they have to teach in. <clears throat> Let's move on to the length and content of the bilingual matura classes. In most cantons, the gymnasium starts after the obligatory school time. Most students start their immersion program in either the 9th, 10th or the 11th school year. It takes around three to four years to get the mature diploma with which a student can then go study at all Swiss universities. It is quite diff difficult to determine which subjects are taught in the immersion language because that sometimes varies from semester to semester and not all subjects are taught all throughout the gymnasium. The two subjects that are most taught in the immersion language however are history and math followed by art, biology, chemistry, geography, physics, economy, and or law. History and math, however, are the top runners, which mainly has to do with them being obligatory subjects through, throughout the years. During their time at the gymnasium, students get in touch with the immersion language around 26.9 to 33% of the time. This includes the subjects taught in the immersion language as well as the language lessons themselves. The average lessons per week are around 33, 34 lessons. That means that around that weekly around 10 to 11 lessons are taught in the foreign language. What is interesting to note is that when asked 
two thirds of the gymnasiums don't feel like there is a difference between the normal, so the monolingual and the bilingual Matura classes. Some schools also offer assistant measures when the students, where the students get individual consultation or supplementary lessons when they feel overwhelmed with the material or do not have good marks. Some schools also have assistant teachers to help the teachers and the students when they have problems with the foreign language. Sometimes a stay abroad in a country where the target language is spoken is compulsory, but those stay abroad in most cases only last about a month. In most partial immersion programs at Swiss gymnasiums, a stay abroad is not planned. And if it is, it is not compulsory. More than half of the gymnasiums also offer language diplomas, such as the DELF for French, the Cambridge Certificate for English, or the Zertifikat Deutsch for German. Most of the time, those language certificates can be done on a voluntarily basis, which might have to do with it being quite a costly matter. If we want to measure the language proficiency of the students after their matura, we, we could use those language certificates as a basis. This would mean that after three to four years of bilingual education, the students would be independent or even proficient speakers in a second language. In 2006, 2004, 57 new students started with their immersion program at a Swiss gymnasium. That is a plus of 330% in comparison to the year 2000-2001. Let's see how the classes are organized and come about. Some but nearly not all gymnasiums have a selection process for their immersion program. That means that not all students after they have passed their entrance, entrance exam, are entitled to be part of a bilingual Matura class. Most gymnasiums with selection processes look at the marks of the individual students. Sometimes it is the overall average that counts, sometimes just the average of certain topics. Most commonly, there are one to two new bilingual classes per year with around 15 to 23 students. Doing a bilingual immersion program does not mean automatically that there is a, let's say, pure bilingual class. A lot of the time, a handful of students are integrated in a non-bilingual class. When asked in the self-assessment test conducted by the EDECA, around 60% of the gymnasium stated that the dropout rate of bilingual classes is lower than in regular classes. This might have to do that a lot of gymnasiums offer probation periods of one semester where students can try out if they are suited for a bilingual class. But of course, there are also students dropping out of the class the main reason for that is not because of the overall mark being too low, but because of the, the demands being excessively high so that the students often can't cope with the workload. Overall, the bilingual gymnasium seems quite an attractive option as the demand is still going up each year. And until now, I only focused on the students, but there are no schools without teachers, so let's see what criteria there are for teachers wanting to teach a bilingual class. As we saw when I talked about the federal regulations, the cantons are responsible uh, that they employ teachers who are sufficiently qualified in the foreign language they have to teach in. So almost every gymnasium has its own regulations concerning that. Um, what can be noted is that gymnasiums in the German-speaking part of Switzerland more often want teachers to have a language certificate in, comparisons to, in comparison to other parts of Switzerland. 
Other schools just want teachers with good knowledge of the target language, while some want teachers to have native or near native ability. Some gymnasiums also want that the teacher um, want the teacher to have studied the language at the university or spend a certain time amount of time in the region where the language is spoken. As we see, the demands vary quite a bit. This is also the case when we look at if teachers need additional uh, formation. At 23 gymnasiums, they need to do an additional formation. In eight, this is not a requirement at all. And 15 say that they do strongly recommend it. Although I personally find it quite important that the cantons are guaranteed their freedom when it comes to employing their teachers, I also think it can be quite dangerous if the teachers teach in a language they are not fluent in or do not feel very comfortable or confident in, as this might lead to error fossilization on the student's side. What I couldn't find out is was who actually decides if a teacher, for example, has good knowledge of the language he wants to teach in. It would be interesting to see if they, for example, consult English or French teachers, since only someone who is proficient in a language can truly determine if another person is proficient in it as well. But that's my opinion. In any way, I think now it would be interesting if we just would take a step back and look where we can put our Swiss model when we compare it with other bilingual education models. In his book, Foundations of Bilingual Education and Bilingualism, Colin Baker differentiates between weak and strong forms of education for bilingualism. In weak forms of bilingual education, bilingual pupils do exist, but it's not necessarily the intended outcome. Mostly those weak models are concerned with assimilating the language minority children within the language majority. As this is not the case in our Swiss model, we will take a look at the different strong forms of bilingual education programs where bilingualism has an intended outcome. Just as a side note, um, Baker defines bilingualism pretty broadly. According to Baker, someone is not only bilingual if he or she has native like ability in two languages at the same time. He does not provide a strict definitions, definition thing, since he does not think that bilingualism can really be defined. He also points out that in some models, people such as tourists and business people, which can only produce a few phrases and greetings, would also be considered bilingual. So when I talk about becoming bilingual, that does not mean that the students speak two languages, languages with um, native like ability, but only that he or she has certain competences in a language in addition to his first language. If that makes sense. The first model we are going to look at is the immersion model. The, biling the bilingual immersion program actually derives from Canada and it is an umbrella term for different immersion types. The aim is for mostly monolingual students to become bilingual without losing achievement in their native language. Early immersion means that students get in contact with, with a second language at the kindergarten or, or infant stage, while middle immersion means that students learn a new language at the age of 9 to 10. It's called late immersion when the second language is learned at secondary level. There's also full and partial immersion. Full immersion is when a student starts learning a language with 100% immersion reducing after a few years to 80% and finishes around with around 50%. Partial immersion simply means that the students are taught close to 50% immersion in the second language. Immersion students are taught in the same subjects as in normal classes. 
the second model is called maintenance or heritage model, where a minority language is protected and developed alongside the majority language. An example for that is the Maori language in New Zealand or Irish in Ireland. 10 to 50 percent of the curriculum is taught in the minority language with the aim to preserve an ethnic language and its culture. The third model is two-way model, also called dual model. It typically occurs when there are two language groups with equal numbers of students. Both languages are taught at 50%. Besides from wanting the students to become proficient in another language, this model also aims to enhance intergroup communication and cultural awareness. The final model is called mainstream bilingual. The students have some lessons per week where they are taught the language as if they were taught another subject such as history or physics. With this model only few become fluent in the second language so that only some children really become bilingual because three foreign language lessons per week simply is not enough for most students to acquire a new language. So where can we locate the Swiss model in there? One thing we can exclude is the mainstream bilingual model. As in the Swiss gymnasiums with bilingual classes, it is not only the language lessons, but also subjects, other subjects that are taught in the second language. But what about the others? <clears throat> the standard at Swiss gymnasiums is the late partial immersion model. As we saw earlier on, up to 50% of the subjects are taught in a second language. The classes are mostly monolingual and the aim is to become bilingual through teaching certain subjects in a foreign language. When we look at the Romansh language, which is only spoken by 0.5% of the population, we could argue that the maintenance heritage model also applies to some of our Swiss gymnasiums. Through par partially teaching in the Romansh language, as it is done at a gymnasium of Graubünden, for example, the language is kept from dying out, which is essentially the goal of the maintenance model. And there are also some gymnasiums um, in Switzerland that use the dual or two-way model. In a gymnasium in Biel, students who have French or German as native language are put in one single class and both languages are used equally. So again, we see that Switzerland is not only diverse language-wise, but there are also various uh, different models used at Swiss gymnasiums when it comes to bilingual education. So we already got to the conclusion of my podcast. Here I just want to reiterate the most important points. Switzerland is a multilingual but not a bilingual country. There have been some debates about which language should be taught first in primary school. There has been an enormous decrease in bilingual mature classes. English is the preferred language and even though there are some federal regulations, cantons still have a fair amount of control over the way um, they choose to structure their bilingual immersion programs. And finally, what we looked at in the end, the three models, the late partial immersion model, the maintenance heritage model and the two-way dual model can be found at Swiss gymnasiums. Those are my references. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope this podcast has been informative. I certainly learned a lot I didn't know before. <laughs>